<laughs> you couldn't hear me. <laughs> well, I won't ring it again for the benefit of the people sitting right up here. Uh, again, thanks for surviving the parking kerfluffle and getting here. Um, I'm Ron Barnes, and it's my honor to be president of this great organization. And uh, thank you for being with us today for the celebration of service. The thought for the day, the secret of getting ahead is getting started. So as you think about that, it makes a lot of sense. Now that was Mark Twain, by the way, for those of you who uh, uh, know these quotes. Now, Judy Schroeder will give our reflection, Judy. Thank you, Ron. There's a book that I'd like everyone to read. It's called The Bill of Obligations. We just got through paying our taxes, which is one of our duties as citizens. But this book is about the shoulds, not about the musts. Uh, thank you, Tyler. So, just in case you don't read the book, let me quickly give you a summary. Uh, the author, by the way, is Richard Haas, who spent 20 years as president of the Nonpartisan Council on Foreign Relations and has extensive work worked for the State Department and the Defense Department and the White House under several administrations. So be informed. That's pretty self-explanatory. Get involved. Stay open to compromise. Haas says, when did compromise become a for letter word to silence those with whom you disagree and civility is not censorship, but civility is respect. Reject violence. the media, appoint only those who are qualified to positions of authority, allow legal processes to play out without political pressure, tell the truth. There are more, but I thought those were good ones to emphasize. Promote the common good. I don't have to talk about that with Rotarians because the reason that we're Rotarians is because we're tr what we believe in community and trying to make it better. Respect government servants. Haas says opposition to strong government, big government, has morphed into outright hostility to government and a rejection of its legitimacy and authority. Respect government service goes right along with get involved. And I want to thank those who serve on boards, commissions, councils, those, my, my hat is off to you. Thank you so much. <clears throat> Support the teaching of civics. Okay, when I was in high school in San Jose, we had to pass swimming to graduate. My, my son graduated from Cornell. He had to pass swimming to graduate. 
Haas wants us to have to pass courses, a course, a required course in civics. I'm not sure that's going to happen, but I really wish that every native born American had to take, had to pass the American civics test, which is required of those who are naturalized. I quizzed my daughter-in-law when she was going to take that. And I thought, this is good stuff. We all should know this, not just those who are taking this test in often in a language not their own in order to be citizens. Finally, put country first. That one got me, I sort of stood back, but what he means is put American democracy before party in person. This does not, uh, this can be, uh, you can be part, you can put your country first as part of the loyal opposition, but it's an opposition that's based in principle and policy, not politics. The party in power should not equate opposition with disloyalty. When I first thought of this, I, I, when I first saw this, I thought of a slogan that has always offended me, my country right or wrong. When that was said on the floor of the Senate in 1871, Senator Carl Schurz, who was a naturalized American said, my country right or wrong, if right to be kept right, and if wrong, to be set right, following these obligations of good citizenship. Thank you. Thanks, Judy. Again, those of you who enjoy the roundabout every week, you need to understand that Judy's the lady behind getting that roundabout uh, edited and, and out to you. So again, thank you for your great reflection and the work you do for our club. So thank you. Steve Engel will introduce our guest, Steve. It's my pleasure to introduce our guest today, and um, all three of our guests today are from Rotaract, so they already know about Rotary, and uh, after I call your names, would you stand up so we can acknowledge you, please? First, we have uh, Yahya Kader, and then Ahmed Al-Jamal, right? There you go, and Jim, or June Wan. Thank you. Thanks for coming, kids. Joy, do we have any guests online? Yeah, kids, thanks for coming. <laughs> Hi, Rotoractors. We have joining us on Zoom this afternoon, we have Cassandra Husky from the Sunrise Club joining us. And then we also have Beverly Callender Anderson joining us. And I'm going to guess as a guest of Jim Bright. <laughs> thanks, everyone. Thank you, Joy. And again, for our guests, uh, you're always welcome. Come back again. Uh, we won't always have parking problems for you. Uh, we have Rotary birthdays to celebrate today. We have Sarah Cochran, who is also our greeter today. Sarah. Whitney Cordoba, uh, April 19th. Peggy Frisbee, the 21st of April. Kay Leach, the 15th. She always remembers tax day, I'm sure. Megan Neese, April 13th, and Mark Peterson, the 17th. And our one uh, person who has a Rotary anniversary is Marilyn Wood, nine years. So. <clears throat> Doc here is also here with us and he's gonna have a 
a PhD awarded real soon, if I hear correctly. Outstanding. As I always told my students, their dissertations are so great, why hasn't anybody written two? So. I was, uh, my arm was twisted a little bit by Sally to remind all of you that uh, the book club is gonna meet at her house on Wednesday, the 17th at 7.30. She will serve drinks and little Italian cookies. Um, and they're gonna discuss, discuss uh, Michael uh, Coitera's book, Corrido, sorry, uh, So Cold the River. This is set in West Baden, so apparently somebody lost some money and uh, wanted to respond in writing a book. Um, I do have an item for you. We're gonna auction off this lovely bottle of Riesling wine that was given to us by our friends, uh, George and Christy, when they were here. Christina, were here uh, as guests of Jim. So the proceeds of the bottle that we get in the auction will go to Teacher's Warehouse. So the bids are open today. Who would like to make a bid for this great bottle of Riesling? And by the way, it has a gold label, which means it passed all standards of German. $30, thank you, Len. 50. 50, thank you, Jim. 60. Thank you, Jeff. Whoa, we have 100. Any others? Thank you, Alan. It is yours. Enjoy. I do also want to mention to you that next week there will be no parking problems. We will have a great club assembly. We will be at St. Mark's Church on the bypass. Now, again, a lot of times when you think about, oh, it's a club assembly, I, I don't know. Well, please come. This is going to be an exciting club assembly because particularly for new Rotarians, it's an opportunity to find out about the service that we do as a club because we're going to have the many of the of the committee chairs talk about their plans. We're also going to have a goal review because one of the things we are required to do each year as a Rotary Club is to submit some goals to the district and then put the numbers behind those goals. And I'd like to have the, the chairs look at an email that both Tracy and I sent to you to give us some data so we can share it with the club very specifically at our club assembly. So please mark that on your calendar at St. Mark's, not here. No parking problem. Tracy. Let me just suggest that you get your goals in or I will assign it to you. I don't know. <laughs> You've been warned. There we go. We have an exciting program today, and uh, Jimmy Torrey is going to introduce our, our program. Jimmy? Thank you. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, fellow Rotarians, oh. you can take it, I guess. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, no, I would have. Um, anyway, I want to um, introduce Carrie Stillians, uh, the executive director of Middleway House. She is a graduate of Indiana Wesleyan University, where she is also uh, finishing up her master's degree. Um, she's been with Middleway House since 2018 when she started as an intern, and like I said, now she's the executive director. Having worked closely with uh, Carrie for the past year, two years, um, I've really been able to see her passion for her job, for her staff, for the clients, uh, for the community. Um, working with her, I can really see um, what Rotarians uh, use the motto, service above self. Um, she's a great inspiration to work with, and without further ado, Carrie Stillians. Thank you so much for having me here today and allowing me to talk a little bit about Middleway House with you all. And Jimmy, thank you for your kind words. Today is one of those days, kind of like 
if you remember those old Morton salt ads, when it rains, it pours. And so it was really nice to have a little break and spend time with all of you all. Um, just as I start out, I wanted to share that, you know, we're going to talk about some things that can be hard to hear. So if you need to take care of yourself, please feel free to step out um, or let me know if you need to talk afterwards. I'll be available. Um, Middleway House is an organization that serves survivors of domestic violence, sexual violence, and human trafficking. We have a wide array of support services for people who have been affected by intimate partner violence, sexual violence, and human trafficking. Um, we're based here in Bloomington, but we do have three outreach offices in Green, Martin, and Owen counties. Within our service area, we also have Lawrence and, and Morgan counties. At Middleway House, we have a re um, within those services, we have a couple of residential programs. Our emergency shelter is something that most people think about when you hear about Middleway House. Those, for those individuals who are immediately fleeing violence. We also have uh, transitional housing, which is our RISE 28 unit housing for individuals who have their children with them. In addition to the residential services, we have non-residential services that are open to anyone who's experienced these types of violence in their lifetime. Legal Advocacy, our Crisis Intervention Program, which operates our 24-7 Help and Crisis Line, as well as our On-Scene Advocacy Program. So if someone has experienced an assault, um, our specially trained advocates can go with them to places like the IU Health Hospital or the Bloomington Police Department to make a report, to go through an evidentiary exam. So we are able to be there and allow people to not have the option to not have to go through what they're going through alone. We also have youth programming in our transitional housing and support groups for survivors of domestic violence, sexual assault, and incest. And we wanna make sure that as we are building these services and providing these services, that we are there for survivors at all steps of their journey. You know, we often on our crisis line, we'll talk to someone who, you know, is just starting to think about leaving a relationship or they've left a relationship a long time ago. Um, we often hear from individuals who experienced violence and held that to themselves. I remember one person in particular that carried um, an assault with them in silence for 50 years and I was the first person that they told. And so I think having that space is, it's hard, but it's very special to be um, someone that's able to do that. When we're talking today, you'll hear some different language um, or just when we're talking about survivors of violence, um, you'll hear different language. Um, often you'll hear either the term victim which is often used in court proceedings, law enforcement use that because that's how statutes are written. But we utilize the term survivor at Middleway House because it does have a bit more empowerment to it. It does um, restore the sense of autonomy that that person has, letting people know that they are more than what happened to them. But ultimately it's really important to listen to the person you're with. Um, I'm someone who's experienced domestic violence, and I would prefer to just be called by my name. M naming me, seeing me over what I experienced is so important because it gives less power to what happened. At Middleway House, we go, we utilize the empowerment model. And so what that looks like in practice is we're providing survivors access and information on resources that are appropriate for them. We're not going to just give somebody every resource because we want to make sure that we're providing them with what they need and what's appropriate for their situation. Within the empowerment model, we want to make sure that the survivors that we work with are active participants. You know, we're not just telling them what they need to do. 
we are giving them that information and empowering them to make those decisions for themselves. themselves. One thing we also do, which can be really challenging, is to allow people to make their own choices, even when those are choices that we don't want for them. We don't want someone to have to go back into violence. Um, but we know that the survivors we work with are the experts in their own lives. They know their situation, themselves, their children, and their abuser better than we ever will. So sometimes a decision that doesn't seem like a great idea to the outside is the best, I, the best situation that they could be in, and they're making the best choice to keep themselves safe. You know, when we work with survivors, we know that they've had an incident of violence that has taken away their power and their control. And sometimes as friends, family members, and service providers, we wanna just make everything okay. Um, so it's really important for us to, to not, you know, step back, think about it, and not um, do that immediately because it can be just as difficult navigating a family member trying to be helpful as it is your abuser because you have one more person putting um, expectations on you. We also want to utilize trauma-informed care. So when we're working with survivors, we know that the impacts of trauma are impact the way that we develop our coping mechanisms and our social development. You know, we don't want to look at people and think, what's wrong with you? How do we fix you? We want to think about what happened to you and how do we help you cope with this? You know, we want to emphasize the strengths of that person because every single person, no matter who they are, holds strengths. And we want to make sure that we're building the resources with them and assisting them in building skills that they need, that they identify they need. One really good example of this, I think, is, you know, when we are in our communities, we're looking at individuals and instead of seeing them for their symptoms, we're seeing them for who they are, their strengths, their experiences, and we're able to better help that person in a client-centered manner. You know, one of the places that I've seen this really clearly is when I worked in a recovery block at the jail providing um, support groups. The mass majority of those individuals in those groups experienced some sort of trauma in their lives. And these groups were within a recovery block and both men and women identified violence as either a child or an, as an adult in an intimate partner relationship. And often the reason they started with the substance that they were incarcerated for was because they were trying to cope. I think another example is when we see individuals living in homelessness, there's often our society provides a narrative that's not always right, you know, making assumptions that someone is lazy or someone is just a bad person. Um, and I think this is a really good example. When we work with people that are living in homelessness at Middleway House, it's really important to understand that homelessness and domestic violence are cyclical. You know, when someone is leaving a domestic violence situation, they might, they're often going into homelessness. Or if someone's leaving an incarceration or drug treatment center and they don't have a place to go because of barriers such as bad credit, the criminal history, or no income, they're often put in situations when they need to, you know, depend on the kindness of strangers. And oftentimes that's not a real kindness. We find individuals who are put in situations to, that are forced to, you know, provide sexual favors or other things in order to have a couch to sleep on. And so it's really hard and very 
important for us to acknowledge that not everyone we see that is homeless is there because they want to. Um, when we look a little bit closer at domestic violence and how it in, intersects with homelessness, um, you know, in dom domestic violence is one of the primary reasons of homelessness for women and children. About 80% of homeless mothers have experienced domestic violence. And about 40% of people who have experienced domestic violence have become homeless at some point in their life, no matter who you are. You know, someone who's experiencing financial abuse, being blocked access of, to work, those things all come into play. And when you don't have that income coming in, it's really hard to find housing. And oftentimes people in violent relationships will be leaving multiple times. Statistically, it's seven to nine times. So there are times when we will see people with multiple um, instances of homelessness in their life. And so also one of the main barriers for people who are leaving relationships is the lack of housing. Do you stay in your home where you've been for however long? Or do you leave a situation to the unknown, going to an emergency shelter or going to the street? So I think it's really important for us to acknowledge that and understand that those abusers are often using leverage against the survivor, you know, especially if there's children involved. You know, if you leave this situation, your kids are going to be homeless. And then they use that to keep that person in the relationship. And so I think it's really important, um, as I've said before, is just making sure that we're looking at people for them as a person and acknowledging that every single person has value and they have a place with us. Um, and if anyone has any interest in becoming involved with Middleway House, there are a lot of ways to do that. Um, you know, one great way is to talk about it, to talk about things that are happening in our community because it is happening. We just might not see it within our, with our own eyes. Um, also having someone come talk to your group about it, fundraising, and also, um, just attending events, being a, in places where we're raising awareness. I just wanted to open up to see if anyone has any questions. I just want to thank you for handling the um, highly important work that you do, valuable work you do for our community. I'm curious, <clears throat> how do you get your funding to carry out this work? So a lot of our funding comes from grant sources. We're actually having some, some funding changes coming up with um, the, the VOCA funding, which is mandated by the Violence Against Women Act. So we are going to be seeing some grants decreasing. So we're working on diversifying how we are funding programs. Um, but in addition to that, we also are funded by private donors. Is human trafficking a, a big problem in this area? We do see human trafficking quite often. What is interesting about it is not everybody who's experiencing it realizes that that's what they're ha that's happening to them. Oftentimes, it seems like they're in a domestic violence situation. Um, but once we get through some of those layers, you see that that dating relationship is not actually a relationship. Um, and they're being forced to do things by that partner, um, such as engaging in criminal activities or um, commercial sex, things like that. Good afternoon, everyone. This is Marcus Whitey with the Community Foundation. Carrie, thank you for that really helpful and informative presentation. I've got a question. 
I know at one time, Middleway was providing preventative services like in the schools for mm -hmm. young people. Is that still happening? And can you talk yes. about that just a little bit? Thank you for bringing that up. We are still providing our building healthy relationships curriculum within the school system um, in middle and high school levels. Um, we are also just doing a lot of community outreach. Our crisis intervention program and prevention programming are getting out there in our communities, especially those most impacted by these types of violence and doing outreach regularly. Carrie, thank you for the work that you do. Two questions. Uh, firstly, do you have uh, in your mind some data that you can share what the trend has been over the last 10 years? Because we all have assumptions, but there seems to be a void of information, first question. Secondly, um, what is the breakout of men versus women? Because I tend to assume it's mostly women, but I know through the work I do at CASA, that's not always the case. Mm -hmm. I can, um, Michael, can I send you some, uh, some statistics that are a little bit farther out than what I have on top of my brain? Um, but um, yes, men are also uh, often survivors of violence. The thing about working with men that makes it difficult is that in our society, we are really, we're trained to think of men as the providers, the strong person, and oftentimes, men that are experiencing violence don't want to come forward because they feel as though what they're experiencing shouldn't be happening to them because it doesn't fit within our, our gender norms. Um, we also, one of the hardest things that I have heard in shelter, um, you know, when we have men coming into shelter and they've experienced violence that is just as intense, if not more than some of the other people in the shelter, they don't want to come because they don't want to hold a bed for, from somebody who really needs it. And that, um, again, goes along with those gender norms and how we in society um, treat men who experience this. We do have a question on Zoom. Go ahead. Go ahead, Joy. Beverly, do you want to go ahead and ask your question? Beverly? Beverly, you're muted. We can't hear you, Beverly. We'll go ahead and get- Okay, let's, we'll come back. Hey, I just really want to thank, thank you for coming. And um, also, I really appreciate the fact that y'all acknowledge people as people, as opposed to just mere objects or uh, victims of their trauma and everything like that. Um, I have a family member who's gone through some type of sexual abuse and different things like that. And I was wondering what is the best approach? And I know this can kind of differ depending on the situation, but for like a family member to be there for somebody, because you know what I mean? Of course, you don't want to say, okay, do this, do this and do that. Mm -hmm. But what's the kind of um, best way to kind of just be an advocate or just kind of be someone that's there to help the situation in some way? Yeah, I think one of the really important things is, you know, just saying or letting that person understand that you believe them and that you are there through this with them and asking them, what do they want in this moment? Do they need emotional support or are there actions that they want to take? Um, oftentimes I have found when we're going out to the hospital and things, People just want to be heard. They don't want to be alone. And then you can also offer resources like our 24 seven help in crisis line. We serve individuals on that line from all across the country. Um, and I think just really being there, be listening to them and honoring what their wishes are, are really big. I can say in my experience personally or they wanted me to do x y and z and it became so difficult that i actually stopped talking to them and so just kind of listening to them and seeing where they're at and what they need in that moment is really the most important and sometimes it's not you know not doing anything just being there thank you beverly is unmuted now Okay, so sorry about that glitch earlier. Um, I was 
thank you, Carrie, for your uh, comments, and thank you, Marcus, for a asking my questions earlier. Um, but I do have another question, and I wanted to ask Carrie if she could talk a little bit about uh, the work of the RISE and, and the things um, in transitional housing um, and where that is going or, or what's happening there, and also about the volunteer training that they offer. If people are interested in becoming volunteers, what kind of training is available for that? Certainly. I'll go ahead and start out with the volunteer training. So we are in the getting ready for our next volunteer training. So if individuals are interested in volunteering with our agency, they can either contact us through the 24-7 Help in Crisis line, or we can, they can also um, reach out to volunteer at middlewayhouse.org. And we will get them set up. We have a series of modules going over the basics of domestic violence, sexual violence, and human trafficking um, that they would need to complete before they're starting their service. And then we would have another in-person interactive portion of our training. Um, and then once that is completed, I know it's a lot, but there's a lot of that goes into being a volunteer at Middleway House, especially if you are working in direct service. Um, and then you would start your program specific training. Um, so at the rise, we, like I said earlier, we have 28 units of transitional housing for individuals who have custody of their children at least 50% of the time. Um, within the rise, we also have um, support services um, such as, you know, advocacy, we have programming, um, and that's also another great way for people to get involved. If someone has an expertise in a specific area, say you are wonderful at creating resumes or teaching people how to do that, um, getting involved in those programs are really important. And we are currently looking, you know, I think Beverly kind of touched on it a little bit, um, based on funding sources, we're kind of looking at what's the best model for the rise. And if we um, perhaps need to move to a permanent housing um, solution. And so we're kind of looking at that and there shouldn't be any changes for the, the survivors living there. Um, essentially, they would just not have to leave within two years. And so I think for a lot of people, particularly those with a lot of barriers to obtaining permanent housing, that is going to be game changing. So still a little bit in the works, but that is something that we are working toward. Uh, first of all, I wanna thank Jimmy Torrey for arranging for uh, Carrie to be with us here today. Thank you, Jimmy. Um, Carrie, uh, for you, uh, what is the range on the length of stay um, and um, to what extent do you collaborate with other uh, agencies in the area? I, I can imagine you work closely with Beacon, mm -hmm. uh, Wheeler Mission, New Hope and, and others. Um, I'm probably leaving some out, but go ahead, please. Yeah, we work, um, we are all part of the South Central Housing Network. So we work together on those meetings and then also all of the shelter service providers come together um, weekly in a meeting to talk about issues related to homelessness in our community and how we um, can better serve folks. Um, in addition to the shelter providers, we also have folks from IU Health in the city and counties. And I just forgot what else you asked. Okay. The length of stay. So we have we don't have a set firm length of stay. So typically people are moving through the shelter in 12 to 16 weeks based on how long it's taking currently in the community to find housing. But if we have some people who have extensive barriers, you know, with immigration or just other barriers that are keeping their extending the amount of time they need we will keep those folks. So there's not really a set dead deadline, but um, I know we've had a few people that have been at the shelter for almost a year. Okay, all right. Uh, there are a number of social services in this community, way lots of them. And I wanna know to what degree you're, using, you're working with them 
which is follow up on to, to Jim's question. But um, is there any way you're working, anyone you're working with to provide training for jobs or finding jobs and, and getting, helping them move to another place and with working with other agencies to helping them to get to another place and they're thinking about various things, including children, how their children are they're taken care of and whether or not they can get employment. I know at one point Middleway worked a lot on that. I wonder if anything's happening with that today. We do have within our youth program, particularly as we have families going through the rise or through the shelter, um, the nice thing about our youth program is that folks do not have to leave once they leave our services. So we do provide aftercare to those teens that are still um, wanting to remain in our program. And so Priscilla, our coordinator of the youth program has been having individuals coming in and doing kind of career days, having them talk to the students about, you know, what kind of skills you need and getting ready. And we're also in the process of navigating some partnerships with organizations that provide college prep courses and things like that for our students. Um, and we do work with places um, like the Excel Center, getting people connected to further education and getting them connected to after that employment. Hello, thanks for doing Middleway House. And then also, can you talk about maybe the number of staff you have and also maybe the number of volunteers and if you have enough staff, are you, do you have open positions and what prohibits you from expanding? Do you need to expand those kinds of things? So we are in the process um, of hiring. So we do have a number of direct service full-time positions open currently. And we also have some direct service part-time roles open, primarily in our emergency shelter and then the evening time in our RISE. Um, and, and we are right about 47 employees currently. Um, Typically, we're closer to like 55, 60, um, but we are, we're working on a skeleton crew a little bit right now, but it is, we're still making it work. So if anyone knows someone who wants to do this kind of work, please send them my way. I'm just curious if you could elaborate a little bit more on human trafficking. Uh, I know we hear a lot in the media, at least anecdotally, about uh, uh, undocumented immigrants in particular mm -hmm. being human trafficked. I uh, just wondered if here in the com uh, Bloomington community, whether that's a trend you're also seeing at Middleway House. And I, and you've heard, what is it, the crossroads of Indiana. So because we are, have these highway systems that travel um, across state lines, we do see more people coming, being moved across this way. Um, typically we see more domestic trafficking in Bloomington, things like um, domestic servitude, things like that. Someone's starting a position, cleaning for someone or becoming a nanny and their documents are being held or they're just not living in this conditions that they were told that they would be. Um, so that is something, but we have worked with survivors of foreign survivors who have been brought here, um, and we've worked with the Trafficking Victims Assistance Program to get them connected to places closer to home after they've lived in our shelter for a while. You said early on you do work in Monroe County, but also some of the surrounding rural counties. Can you talk about the, the challenges or the cases that you face? Are they the same throughout your system or are there differences between Monroe and the more rural counties? I think the, the situations that people face can be very similar. Um, however, the people in the rural communities often have lack of transportation or often we'll have individuals who have animals that they tend to. They have animals on, a, on their 
farm or land and they don't want to leave because of that. They want to make sure that their animals are taken care of. So we do a lot more um, mobile advocacy, meeting that person wherever they need to, to complete. I have to tell you, the county outfit advocates are some of the true rock stars. They do everything that we do in Bloomington, except for the youth programming and residential services. So they're doing protective orders with people in a McDonald's, you know, all of these things going where people need to be. Um, and I think that distance is one of the hardest things. And then also living in communities where everyone knows everyone. It's really hard when people know all of your business and to try to navigate that. Jerry, I got a question. Um, I, I was the uh, uh, organizer of the Monroe County Domestic Violence Pro, uh, Coalition for uh, about five years. Um, and so I had the opportunity to see it from the inside every month and talk to a lot of people. And Middleway House was pretty involved in, uh, in, in that extensively and had uh, frequently more than uh, two or three people yeah. come every month, um, which was great. Um, at the start, there was uh, a challenging relationship between Middleway and the prosecutor's office. And over the years, it got to be much better. Um, uh, where are you now with that? Because I know that's always been, uh, uh, you know, challenging. You, you know, you have to, you know, take care of people and and getting the people out of society to, that are harming them is a difficult situation. How is your relationship with them now, and uh, and uh, and where do you see it going? I guess. Yeah, um, we regularly so Middleway House is part of the sexual assault response team of Monroe County, and so we are regularly meeting with the sexual assault prosecutors, we have, we're building a new relationship with our current domestic violence prosecutor um, since Amy Oliver has left. But I think that relationship has is continuing to strengthen. One thing that I think can be a barrier is that a lot of the survivors we work with do not want to move forward with prosecution for whatever reason. They've either experienced something either here or in other communities and it wasn't taken seriously by folks within systems or they just want to move past it so i think that might have been some of the barrier there thank you very much thank you thanks thank you very much carrie the Rotary mantra for the year is to create hope in the world. You create hope in this community and the communities around us. So thank you for the work that you do. A donation will be made to Hoosier Hills Food Bank in your honor for your presentation today. And I do want to acknowledge some people that helped make this celebration of service work for us today. Our greeter, Sarah Cochran. Our introducer, Steve Engel. Our Zoom host, Joy Harder. Our reflection, Judy Schroeder, I think of civitatis, the Latin word for civility, and I think it's such a lesson we all need to deal with, so thank you for sharing that. Amy Kendall, who's our reporter today. Michael Shermas, who got bruised as he worked between the tables to get everybody's question. And then obviously Tyler, Martin Taylor, for his great work in keeping our technology running. Our next meeting will not be on Zoom, so you Zoomers may have to get in your car to join us at St. Mark's Church but the technology just doesn't quite work. So bear with us. Now, if you all stand for the four-way test of the things we think, say, or do. First, is it the truth? Second, is it fair to all concerned? Third, we'll build goodwill and better friendships. Fourth, will be beneficial to all concerned. And fifth, is it fun? Have a good week.